Hi, I'm Braxton Cosby, CEO of Cosby Media Production and Star Child Comics. And you guys can find us anywhere on the web. Our homepage is www.cosmomediaproductions with an S.com. And you are tuned in to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented individual with another individual coming later on in the interview itself, who has a publishing company as well as comics and novels and a bunch of awesome comic mediums that I'll let them describe because I wouldn't do it justice. We're joined today by Braxton Cosby, and later on we'll be joined today by Chantal Cosby as well. How are you doing today? Doing great, man. Um, you know, so happy to be a guest on the show. Two Geeks Talking, I'm excited to be here, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Oh, well, hey, that's I love seeing comic publishers, because that's that seems to be a new theme these days, are, are comic publishers publishing amazing comics of varying ethnicities, as well as varying uh, stories and, and themes and everything like that. And we'll definitely dive into all of that. And I I love to be surprised by what's currently out there, and, and I'm glad that you decided to come on the show, so thank you. Thank you. For those that don't know anything about yourself and about Cosby Media Productions, and of course, I forgot to mention Star Child Comics. Tell us what everything is all about. Right. So Cosby Media Productions is a book publishing company. We have over 30 authors in our stable, published over 60 novels, uh, some novellas as well. And that uh, stems all the way from uh, self-help, publishing, inspirational, autobiographies, nonfiction, uh, also fiction. We really find our lane, though, in the fantasy kind of superhero and science fiction genres. So we have a lot of uh, series in that. Uh, we publish books in platforms of ebook, paperback, and novels. And we uh, just started really putting out some hard covers as well. So we love that. This has been a venture that we've been uh, doing since 2012. Last year, uh, I'm a writer who also we publish, you know, our own stuff as well. And I've written over 16 novels. And uh, partnering with uh, four of our other authors who have this, you know, this world we've created, as you can see with Star Child Comics, all these superheroes that we have, um, we decided, hey, you know what, we've got novels, we've got 16 novels across all of our authors, which is about five total. So I partnered with three other ones last year, and we started just having a conversation of, you know, what's our next steps? We've got these novels, we've got this world that we've built, we call it the CMP DSU which is Cosby Media Productions' dedicated superhero universe, you know, where characters are referred to in and out of books. And then we actually came up with Infinity 7 uh, about a year and a half ago, which is our, our team up, kind of like the Avengers Assemble deal. So with this first one, we actually have authors Keyshawn Dodds, uh, Kayo Champion, and myself um, put together this book, which uh, basically has uh, 14 superheroes in it. So they've teamed up already. Wow. Like I said, we have a whole lot more, but we're doing them in waves. So that was Infinity Seven Gods Among Men, book one. Uh, we're working on the outline for book two, and that should be out towards the end of the year, if not the turn of the year, uh, where we have more of their story arc kind of developing. And then eventually with three and four, we're going to try to bring all of our other heroes in as well. Kind of like um, uh, Justice League Infinite. You know, they just kind of just keep bringing in more and more heroes. So uh, when we looked at uh, growing the looked at kind of growing the uh, the world that we built. We said, well, the next natural uh, medium to gravitate into was comic books. So we went ahead and established uh, Star Child Comics, which is our comic imprint of Cosmic Media Productions. We decided we were going to do a Kickstarter, see if we can get it funded. And we wanted to bring out four first issues uh, that actually carry on the stories of characters that have their own series already. So for me, it was the cape. And we brought out um, the Cape Hellfire, which is a continuum of the story. The Cape has three novels in it, uh, Cape, book one, Cape Overdrive, and then Infinity Seven, I kind of count as um, ours because we have uh, Blur, who is the main character in my universe. She's on the cover and she has a huge story arc, which goes on in there. So I picked up Cape Hellfire as an extension right from where that book uh, ends off. Then we have Daniel Payton, who's written the Bark series. He has books one, two, and three, Bark, Mutated Beginnings, Enemies, and we also have Into Madness. His book, 
Bark Power Struggle comes right off of that uh, third novel in that series. Then we have Menzuo, which was written by Keyshawn Dodds. And he has a four book series now. The last book that ended in that one was called um, A Warrior's Destiny. And uh, Menzuo War at Home jumps right off of that storyline. We have Lawrence uh, St. John, who's written the Metatron series, a four book series right now. Um, the last book in that one was called The Secret Grid. Uh, Metatron Terror at the Track jumps right off of that. So we're just having this continuum of stories, you know, so we may play in a couple of um, issues of the comic before we jump back to the story. So we really feel like as an indie publisher, nobody's doing that, right? Most comic publishers are just doing comics or maybe even some graphic novels. Most publishers are just doing novels. So we're out of kind of like a hybrid, you know, with Cosmic Productions and Star Child. We have the opportunity to give you rich lore with these long narratives um, of the of the hero stories. And then we, we hit you with comics where you can actually see the visual representation of the things that we have been building. So we're really excited that people have really um, gotten behind it. Our social media, uh, as we continue to post pictures and things like that, people are excited about it. And uh, my wife and I just went to Fandemic down here in Atlanta, uh, where there were uh, people there uh, who were just, you know, being there for the, con for the convention itself. But when they came out of the table, we kind of gave them our spill and they were loving it. And so we had we had Menzuo with us because uh, Menzuo is completed at this point. And we also have the Cape, which is completed. Bark just got finished. So we're going to start with our uh, publication um, with um, publishing those and have those ready for sale. And then Metatron is right around, I think there's three more pages left. So we're probably about maybe 80% complete with that. So that should be ready towards the beginning of April. So we'll have all four of our first issues ready for sale. Uh, so we're really, really excited. And again, we, we just sell them by the set. You know, you get the Cape Hellfire. Uh, it goes right along with those three books. So you can jump in, you'll have four stories, you know, being told in this universe. And you have the same thing with Metatron. You have five stories because of the four books. And we just keep pushing it that way. So uh, we're just hoping that people are excited. One thing we did to kind of cross promote all of the storytelling is that at the end of the comics, you'll have a QR code and a, a pic, an image of the books themselves uh, that actually told you the origin story of the book, the comic you just picked up. So you scan that QR code with your phone. It jumps you to the page where you have a synopsis of all the books and it also has the links to where you can purchase them. You know, so we, we just feel like we've given people, we've kind of handheld them through the process of coming into our world. And, uh, you know, a lot of our books have been recognized. They've gotten awards. They've been Amazon bestsellers. So we feel like people are going to jump into something that's fresh. And I know you talked about it already that you want something new, you know, and we're hoping that um, what we're doing as an indie, indie publisher is giving people the opportunity to really dive into a whole new world. Because if you're, kind of inundated with the Marvel and DC universe. And, you know, you've done all the Batman you can anymore, all the Superman you can, and you want something new, this is definitely the opportunity to jump in on board with that. It's safe to say that you are going to be busy for a long time. Um, <laughs> based off of that that intro, you've created a, a universe. I'm not even going to say world. This is a universe. I mean, right. you've created a universe with so many characters when this first got started because you you're talking about collaboration with a variety of different creative individuals right. to build the universe here so it's not just a one person job <laughs> when it comes to the the first seed that kind of stuck in your mind that forged this universe you know what was it and why did you want to keep building upon that universe with that first seed right um i would say that honestly i give all the credit to Keyshawn dodds before Keyshawn came on board with us as a publisher he had already written about three novels in the in Menzuo series and he had self-published them. And um, he was introduced to me. We kind of talked about what he had going on. I was like, and that, that's when superheroes were kind of starting to get really popular again with, with, um, with television and film. So it was, uh, it was somewhat of a risk because it's like, Hey, superhero, like who's going to read a superhero novel? Maybe not, you know, make people really into comics and movies, but let's do it. Cause I love what he was talking about with the storyline where basically he, uh, Menzuo kind of represented him and one of the other characters in the story named Sola represented his really, really good friend when they started thinking about this idea years ago. And his friend was battling cancer. Um, and then they actually made one of the enemies in the first novel, uh, Cancer, kind of representing that. So as they tell the story, you get this real um, juxtaposition of, the, of him 
in this world of himself. So I just thought it was interesting. And his friend actually did uh, pass away uh, from cancer, but the dream still burned within him to uh, to get this character out here, get him into novels. And eventually that was his dream is to get comics done. So when we brought him on, we kind of uh, gave Menzuo a new skin. We rebranded him, got him the logos and everything and everything just started building, 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 building. And it got popular. And I started going, man, you know, I kind of see something here. And then um, our other author, uh, Kayo Champion, had written Majesties of Canaan. And so we thought it would be really cool if we just start kind of referencing each the heroes in this world. So we said, let's build a universe, like you said, let's just build this thing out. And then I jumped in with uh, the cape and the cape really started off almost like a, I, I was almost thinking of it as like a joke, you know, like, hey, you know, I'm gonna make this crazy story for these superheroes and these superheroes are gonna have a lot of flaws. And I'm just gonna tell this story regardless of if people have a lot of flaws, like we all are anyway, but these guys are really, really broken. If you gave people like this superpowers, what would they do? What would it look like? And so um, I just built on now as I was writing the story, I was like, actually, this is actually starting to be really, really cool. This is coming together well. So I would start taking it more seriously. And then I ended up um, getting that going. And then we just, like I said, we just cross pollinated, talking about each other, referring to the other people in this world. And then Daniel Payton came on with Bark and then Lawrence came on with Metatron. He had already written two of the Metatron series. So a lot of these authors were kind of trusting us to take their stories to the next level. So I was really, really uh, enthused with that. And before you know it, here we were sitting with 16 uh, novels, you know, and it was like, man, like this, this is really working, you know? So um, we're pleased with the stories that we've told. We feel like there's a lot more to go. And um, we're just glad that, you know, readers are just coming on board and, and being excited, you know, and, and they're really starting to take notice of what we got going on. Being a publisher can't be an easy gig. What are some misconceptions about being a publisher that maybe the general public that loves your medium don't know about? People think that as soon as you put a book out, you're going to be number one bestseller on Amazon <laughs> or anybody. And man, let me tell you, it takes a lot of work. They feel also that the publisher is going to do everything for them. That is not a lot of legwork that they have to do. And the publishing industry has really changed especially for indie publishers. We have to do a lot of footwork social media wise. We have to partner with other people. You know, hey, I, you promote this, I'll promote that kind of a thing to really get our, our name out there. And we don't have these huge reading lists, access to all these readers that the, the big five do. So it takes a lot of legwork. So I tell people, you know, you gotta have your social media in place. You have gotta be willing to push and promote the stuff that we do because we are very generous to authors. We make, uh, we give them book trailers. We give them marketing kits. We try to give them what we feel is the industry standard of interiors for their books. When people open up the book and they read it, they go like, okay, this actually looks like the big people. Uh, and we also try to really work hard to give them uh, quality book covers. So there is a lot of responsibility on the authors to say, hey, once we give you all this, what are you going to do with it? You know, we don't want to just publish people who just want to say, yeah, I'm an author. That was great. And I've had a few of those folks come in and out and I've gotten burned just because we put all this time and resources into getting the book out and then you do nothing with it. So there is... A misconception that, you know, the, the publishing company is going to do everything for me, so I don't have to do anything. And that's just false. If you really want to be successful, you really want to build a brand and you want people to take you seriously. A lot of this is going to come from uh, a lot of background and elbow grease from you. So you have to have some skin in the game. And once you do, I think there's an opportunity for you to really uh, embrace it. I love being a creative. I not only write novels, I write screenplays. And now writing the scripts for our comics, because there's a, a nice a skill set to doing all three with the three act structure, act one, act two, act three, across all three of those platforms, because it's a challenge where you've got 22 page novel, which is what we've decided to do as a publisher. A lot of people would maybe do like 18 or 19. We want to give people a little bit more story. So uh, we've invested to give them 22 pages. That's different from the type of story that I would write in a novel, which I have a lot more uh, room to play with, you know, in a screenplay where I'm kind of jamming this in, you know, it's a minute a page when it comes down to screenplays. So if you got 90 pages, you got a 90 minute uh, screenplay. So there is quite a bit of a, of a developing of a skill. And I really have the expectation that our authors should put as much into perfecting their writing, their ability to tell a, a congruent story that people will enjoy as much as we're going to do our part of trying to push that and get them ready to be a part of what a part of the industry 
it's a big sea of picky <laughs> uh, fan base. They look at everything. They look at the covers. They look at the interiors. They read the story. They want to know about the protagonist. They want to know the antagonist. They want to know the story. These folks are serious. And if you take it seriously, you can really build a fan base that people are, you know, they're excited. You know, we get people coming up and they want to take pictures with us at these conventions when they buy the books. They're like, oh, will you autograph it? Of course we do. And so they want to be a part of it and they want that same kind of feeling that we're getting where we're excited that people are, are actually buying into what we're selling and we're excited that they're actually loving it and, and they're being excited and they come back every year looking for the next book. I've had a lot of lot of creative people on the show in the past year it is, is representation in comics. And I think the one thing that I, I noticed distinctly, not just with your own work, but other people's work as well, mm -hmm. you write about your life experiences and you turn it into something uh, positive and you turn it into a creative outlet for yourself. And right. I can see, I can see that in, in what, what you put together with all of this stuff as well too. How has that helped you as a creative person to be able to put your experiences onto a page in, in the superhero genre? Right. Well, I think uh, one of the keys to writing is to write where you're an expert at. You know, I wrote a, a, a book that was published by um, a Charisma House um, that was a um, health book that had to do with my life as a physical therapist. And I gave as much as I could to that book. I gave, I researched over 72 articles on the content I was talking about. I talked about my experiences as a therapist, as an athlete. And I also talked about my spiritual experiences as well. I kind of put all three of those things in the books. And I feel like I was an expert on that because it was my point of view. So that way, when you're, when you're talking off of a, a position or perspective that you feel you're an expert in, it comes out on the page so much easier because you're not trying to force something and you're not trying to research things that you're not familiar with just to give somebody something to read. So I think when you talk about your personal experiences, um, you're an expert on that. That's your uh, perspective. And if you can put that into your stories and those characters come out uh, so much more naturally, it's, it's an organic story. It's something that you connect with. And if you can connect with it emotionally, uh, then you can convey that on the page. And then you'll have a, a, a group of readers who might relate to that as well. Uh, and hopefully you have a, a broad stroke with that because, you know, everybody can understand the relationship between a parent and a child. So that's very broad, uh, whether it has to do with somebody who's Caucasian or black or Asian, then that might narrow, you know, your, uh, your demographic. But if you've got a bunch of characters who kind of represent all of that, then you're still casting that wide net. And so, um, I'm proud because we have authors of every type of, uh, a walk of life and they're telling their stories in the best way that they can with their characters. And I think that um, people are really um, connecting with those characters on that journey that they have. I'm kind of curious about this. This is a bit of a segue for about being a writer itself, because, uh, you know, there's a huge difference between screenplay writing and comic writing and yes. novel writing, obviously. Yes. Um, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each medium for yourself as a writer? Right. So if I was talking about the strengths and weaknesses of um, novels is that, you know, you do you are allowed to have autonomy to do as much as you want. And I think sometimes people can get really wordy because they're not staying um, with the outline. They're just kind of going off on tangents because they're like, hey, I can write as much as I want. And sometimes you get a 150,000 word book that ends up being like a, a thousand pages. And it's taken a long time to get back to the main focus because you've kind of segued off. But again, that's also the great thing about it is that you can tell the story you want to tell as much as you want. And um, you can give people a lot of detail. And, and screenwriting, you have to be so detailed because every scene counts. No scene can really be a throwaway. If people are just kind of caught in the scene after a while, just kind of going, where are we going? Where are we going? And you have like talking head syndrome going on, you can lose the audience. So you have to be very um, direct and intentional for the story you're telling with each scene. But that also, you do feel boxed in because you feel like, oh man, I got to get the, you know, there's some unwritten rules for scenes that a scene shouldn't go any more than two you know, two to five pages after that, the scene should be over with, we should be moving on. So you do feel very confined mm -hmm. in doing that. And I think with, um, with script writing for comics, you've got, again, like I said, 22 pages. Act one is probably gonna be between uh, one to seven pages. Act two is gonna be from eight to about 19. Act three is gonna wrap you up between 20 and 22. So you're still confined, 
But what's beautiful is you have, you have on each page, you have a lot of panels, anywhere between four to seven. So you can tell those stories in each one of those panels. And so it's a little bit different from a, a script where, you know, you're in scene by scene and here you like panel by panel and uh, there's a, you become the director. So that's also advantageous to you get really excited because you're not directing the uh, viewpoints of, of all your readers as they're scanning that page going from left to right all the way down to the bottom. So I could have like a little reveal at the bottom where the person's grabbing on a doorknob. And then when they flip the page and the door opens up or maybe something bursts in through the door and it's like calamity. But that's it's so invigorating to be able to tell stories through comics. So it's at, getting into it last year. I've read a couple of books. I got some resources on it. Uh, and when I started getting the structure down for how to um, convey the story in a, uh, uh, in a way that was um, detailed, and uh, succinct, I found a lot of success with it because like, you know, now I just finished my second script already for a book I'm bringing out in there uh, later this year. Like I said, we're a hybrid. The novel will drop the same day as the comic. So I'm excited to see what people are going to think about that. I do want to take a moment uh, mm -hmm. for a second here, Kurt, and bring in my wife, uh, oh, Chantel yeah. Cosby. Uh, Braxton was diving head first into everything that Cosby Media Productions is doing. It's amazing. I love it. I love the fact that you have novels and comics and you know you, you have so many different talented individuals coming into play but as a as a marketer as as a marketing person that you are and and co-owner as well too because braxton mentioned that what are your strengths and weaknesses when it comes to promoting so many mediums to the mass that's definitely very interesting um we are of the belief that we want to meet people where they are and that's how we start when it comes to marketing is meeting them where they are so our focus primarily is a lot of low-level marketing lots of social media we really want to make sure that we're introducing what we have um, to the masses getting people interested in what we're doing a lot of our pages that we created we've gotten so much growth in a very short amount of time and people are really digging it for us we want to make sure that we focus on the fan base and the people who are really interested in what we have going on, the content that we produce in the different mediums. In addition to social media, we frequent tons of book and comic conventions. And we actually really love them um, because people are looking for different things to get into, different worlds to be introduced to. So we love it. We love being able to kind of talk to people about what we have and show them not just a book or not just a comic, but an entire world <laughs> that we've created, our own dedicated superhero universe. Um, and so that's amazing. And then, of course, um, doing things like what we're doing today with podcasts and um, just making sure that we are, before we continue to move on into bigger areas of marketing, we want to definitely start low level to really get the fan base and we get our own fan base in line. Once we start doing those other marketing pieces, um, things will fall into place because one of the things that they look for is making sure that what kind of following um, do you have and are people really engaged? So it's not just about getting followers. Like we are very active, we're very engaged and people engage with us back and that is invaluable for us. Marketing is not my strong suit. I'm trying as best I can from a <laughs> from a podcast show perspective for the past 14 years. You're you're one voice in seven billion when it comes to being exactly. a, a creative person. And it's very hard to rise above the the noise, so to speak, here. And and you you do, talked about it briefly as well too in terms of the promotion side of things. What is the most misunderstood aspect about being a marketer that maybe the general public doesn't understand? Because I'm not familiar with marketing from your perspective. So please enlighten us. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think when it, the most misunderstood thing is that you people feel that they can get out there and people are going to love what you do because you did it and you put it out there. And that's just not the case. And that's why we want to start with low level and making sure that we get the fan base. The biggest thing about marketing is making sure that you're segmenting your audience. You can't cast a super wide net and think you're going to catch what you want to catch. Your best bet is to make sure that you are in front of the people who are interested in what you have to offer. That's the biggest thing is understanding your audience, understanding where they are, understanding what they're interested in. And once you find that, then your actual product needs to set you apart. And I think that we've done a really great job of that. I mean, I don't see too many other companies out there that builds 
their worlds in comic novel and now into screenplay format. So we're trying to make sure that we are doing something that the competition or other people are not. And so when you're doing something from a different perspective in a different way, that starts to get you the buzz. You can't stand out if you're doing the same thing that everyone else is doing. You know, I, I heard you went to a comic convention recently. I haven't been to a comic convention in two years because of a pandemic, unfortunately. We <laughs> so, haven't either. We're just getting back into it. <laughs> exactly. So so seeing, you know, being face to face obviously is a better way to promote things than than social media. You know, face to face is always a great interaction, you know. Now, seeing fa- seeing people come to your table and, and seeing your your universe that you've created here, what what has been the reaction, not only from a business perspective, but maybe from a, a personal one on one perspective? Any any stories that you can share that maybe were positive and influential? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, we get examples of that all the time. I mean, just when we are there, who we are and what we've created, you know, I think I love what we have that appeals to so many people of so many different backgrounds, so many different nationalities, male, mm-hmm. female, our books and covers and everything reflects all of that. So I think it Um, When people come by, I think that's the thing that sets us apart is they're seeing not only these beautiful characters, these well-developed pieces, but when they're just glancing just visually, everybody can see a little bit of themselves represented in what we offer. People love it. I mean, just this past weekend, I don't even know if he spoke about it earlier, there was a gentleman, Braxton did a couple of panels as well, where he's talking about um, developing novels into comics. And um, so he had lots of people that came in and and was a part of that. And so they would come to the table after. And there was this one gentleman who was just like, he couldn't even stop smiling and just so enamored with what we had. He left the table, he came back and he's like, you know what, I just have to, you know, just tell y'all this is great. This great seeing what what he's been able to accomplish with writing, you know, over 16 books and screenplays. And he's like, and seeing you look like me, like you're my superhero. And then like, it was like, whoa, we weren't expecting that, but we totally understood that people want to see themselves reflected. And if it's not just a character, even behind the scenes, the mind behind it, you know, you can, you can see Marvel and DC and we love those, you know, characters and those stories, but just seeing a whole universe created by a person of color, kids are able to walk by and say, whoa, this is great. I've never seen someone like you doing this. And this is amazing. And you're my superhero. And I think we were both kind of taken aback when the gentleman said that, but it made us really appreciate what we do and what we offer. And it helped us to really recognize the pull and the responsibility that comes, you know, with, with what we're doing. Um, and it just made it that much more worthwhile for us. What it was an early experience where you learned that language had power. I think it's it's the influence um, that we have. I do a lot of uh, speaking engagements. I even talk uh, at schools. The way you have to go about motivating young people to actually read, because they want to just look at TV now. They want to look at films. I tell them, I say, you know, but the words in here, because that the, the conversion of reading something on paper and in your brain taking that information and having its own interpretation of what the author is trying to convey people create their own characters because they still have a way that they think they look. So, you know, sometimes with our covers, we try to make sure that we give enough detail to kind of paint the picture for everybody, but we also want them to have that experience of their own because, you know, when you read something, you formulate that image in your head. And then uh, sometimes when it comes out on screen, if you get it uh, turned into a film and then they actually cast a character for a role, then you, you might be either disappointed or you might be like, hey, that's spot on. I started really realizing that power of uh, language when I went uh, and did the comic scripts uh, for the Cape because I would hand that script off. I have, you know, I have one scene or one page I've scripted out with about maybe six to seven panels. And I put all the information panel one, let me top left third of the page. This happens. This is the dialogue. This is the special effects, if any, then I go to the next. And I'm really handing that off and trusting that the artist is going to be able to bring that to life the way that I see it. And so um, it really becomes like a child of yours. You know, it's like you're pregnant with it. And then all of a sudden it comes out and you're like, Ooh, what is it going to look like? And, and it's magic, though, when you can have um, when that ar- artist actually nails uh, what you envision in your head. So 
I just really started to appreciate um, the power of language and writing and uh, putting pen to paper. Or in this case, you know, a lot of times it says really clicking on a keyboard uh, because there is a lot um, that can be done. Uh, and I think that's why books are still around now. When I when we first got into this business um, 10 years ago, everybody was saying, oh, paperbacks are going to be gone. It's all about ebooks. So, you know, just get prepared. And uh, paperbacks are still around. You know, that's why we're still going to conventions. We're still selling paperbacks because people still want to feel them in their hands. They want to yeah. hold them. And I even like I do now, if I really, really enjoyed a book that I read on an ebook or even I listened to the audio book. If I have Still a chance to grab it. that book, <laughs> I grab it and just put it on my shelf because I love the way it looks now, you know. So I think um, there's a lot of value to the uh, to the to the uh, art of writing as much as it is as even doing art itself. Wow, I would probably say that. Man, I think that's probably been something that I've I've learned from from quite a while ago. Um, I've also done some film and stuff on the side um, as well. I would probably say I started doing that probably in my early 20s. Um, and so probably around that time was when I realized, um, you know, just kind of the way words are put together and scripts are put together and what you're putting out there um, representing a person or a situation or a community um, that it, it means a lot with the words and the language that's that's used um, in representing those things. Um, and so then, of course, when he and I met and he um, was already very deep um, into writing, that was absolutely one of the things that we were able to connect mm -hmm. together on um, at the very beginnings mm -hmm. of our, our dating life, uh, was that for sure. What is your creative kryptonite? <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> I think it's sleep. You know, sometimes it's, you know, I write late at night because you kind of come home from work and then you do the family thing. You give time to everybody, you help out. And then you've got to, I have to write late at night. So sometimes you are just tired. But one thing I've learned to do is that I don't write when I'm really not in the mood and I really don't have the availability to do so because that's when you're writing. Sometimes I write stuff and I come back to the next day and I'm like, what was this? Was I falling asleep while I was doing it? You know? <laughs> only do it, the creative process, when I'm motivated. And when I'm really, really motivated, man, you can get in and knock out anywhere between two to 3,000 words in a session and you feel really, really good about uh, what you've created. So I try to do it when I really feel that fire. And when I don't, I find something else to do, you know? And, and that way, uh, I feel like I'm giving my best to the work and that um, people will really enjoy it. Absolutely. And I like to help him with that. Um, you know, it's definitely a team effort he works so hard of course you know he's probably t mentioned that he's a physical therapist um, by trade during the day and um so i want to make sure that things are i understand his his process um once he's back into writing whether it's another um script or a novel um and i want to make sure that you know as his support that he's able to keep those creative things going and so if there's things i can help and take off his plate i know he's gonna come in he's he has certain things he's going to want to do when he gets home. And I know at a certain time of the evening, he's going to want to get into the writing. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, whatever distractions and those sorts of things that would prohibit him from being as creative as he can be, that I'm able to help support that for him as well. Is there anything that I haven't touched on? And we'll talk about social media and where we can support you and, and find your, your comics and uh, everything that you're producing uh, as well, too, at, at the end uh, that I haven't touched on and that, that you would like those that are watching and listening to this interview. No, at this point, I don't think so. I think we've kind of kind of uh, um, given a good uh, foundation of what we have going on as far as the company. And I kind of gave a lot of background earlier about Cosmic Media and, and okay. Star Child. So. Uh, my wife, uh, I just want to make sure she came and talked about the marketing, but if she can go, then she can oh, leave cheers. and then we can keep it going. <laughs> awesome. Well, nice to meet you. Thanks nice for having to me. Meet you as well. Thank you so much. So if I could just give a quick uh, synopsis of The Cape. Uh, the Cape is uh, year 2035. Crime in Chicago is just, I mean, it's about as bad as it can be. One day this storm comes and people who are caught in the storm, the next day they wake up with superpowers. Some use them for good, some for bad. Two factions are made, basically the capes, which are the heroes. And then there's also the dark phase, which are the bad guys. Now, in our world that we've created, we uh, like to use the word normals, which are basically regular humans without powers. And we have super normals. So we don't really use superheroes, but we use super normals and normals. 
these two factions start fighting with each other. And even people who might come out one day and go, hey, I got superpowers or they're doing something, whether it's crime or they're doing something for good. If you run into anybody from one of the other sides, they kind of ask you, you know, where's your alignment? And if you say opposite, they'll kill you on site. So it actually became something that was fearful for you to come out and say who you were and what you were doing. You kind of want to keep your powers hidden because you were afraid of who you may run into one day if you didn't join them. And uh, the numbers get down to about six on each side. And uh, finally, there's like a secret truce between the two uh, factions where they say, hey, you know, you got to stay on your side. We'll stay on ours and we'll just keep it moving from there. Well, the city decides to adopt the heroes. And they make they actually rename Chicago as Hero City. And uh, they put them up in high rises. They make them celebrities. They give them endorsements and the whole nine yards. They even have a TV show where these drones follow them throughout the day and collect information on them, like, you know, telling their stories. And then at the end of the night, there's a reality TV show that comes on called The Night Watch. So these guys are really, really doing well. Well, the city does uh, come up with one rule that you cannot break, and that is that you cannot harm a normal as a hero. Um, And one day, the most powerful super normal of all uh, in my group of capes, a thief actually comes on TV and not only admits to harming, a normal, but he actually kills them. Hmm. And uh, so the first book becomes like a murder mystery where you're trying to figure out why he did it, what was his motive. Um, and then, of course, the heroes are trying to catch him because he's messing up their gig. And then you've got the enemies trying to catch him to recruit him. And, you, of course, you have the authorities trying to uh, bring him to justice. So you have this uh, citywide manhunt. And um, in Hero City, there's trackers that are placed inside of the heroes. Um And the trackers do not tell your location unless you go outside of the city. So you've got this 25 uh, square mile radius that you can live in. So nobody really knows where he is. And so um, it becomes, like I said, it's a a murder mystery kind of manhunt. And that's how the first book rolls. And so we reference other characters in the universe through that story, especially towards the end where we talk about Menzuo. We have Bark and uh, his established Bark. And Minzuo and uh, Metatron actually are more like coming of age stories because these are like younger characters who are really trying to find their way. They get these superpowers now. What do I do with them? I know Metatron, he got his powers from like an angel and he's trying to um, trying to figure out the evolution of them. What does he use them for? What's the uh, purpose of having this? So each book, he actually gets new powers that kind of evolve with him as he gets older. Um, and then so... Menzuo is an alien from another planet who comes to Earth. He actually gets adopted by this family, kind of a surrogate family. And now he's trying to uh, figure out as he becomes stepping into his role as a universal protector. Uh, and he's got a group of uh, guys back at his home where he used to live, uh, be. And they've come now to Earth with him to kind of help him on his journey. Uh, and then, like I said, Bark is just, you know, um, he develops his powers. And there's a group called the UCH. Um, I think it's the United Confederation of Heroes uh, that he's a part of, and he's got Snow and uh, Bolt who are in his world. And now, you know, so everybody is kind of building, building, building out these worlds that are now starting to connect. And that was our first book, like I mentioned earlier, was Infinity Seven. Uh, And now the comics are here and it's just continuing. So what's unique about our comics, what we do in the beginning, we have like a little uh, locator box that says, you know, um, following the events of so that now people know, oh, this came from this book. So the cape, it was following the events of the Minity Seven. Menzuo, it was Destiny, um, A Warrior's Destiny. Metatron is a secret grid. And then Bark, episode three is uh, Descent into Madness. You know, we've done that. Um, and that's where the, all these guys you see back here on the banner um, are from. You know, we've got uh, Metatron, we've got Bark, we've got the twin powers, uh, Demeros and Alucio. Uh, we got Sling Blade from Kate, and we've got just a whole bunch of other characters. We even have our main uh, antagonist who's going to be in the story for uh, Infinity Seven, and that's Stratus, who's a space pirate. So um, we and we're even missing like maybe eight more heroes from this banner at this point, because this was really just about what we had in comic form that was coming out right now. So um, I kind of mentioned earlier, I don't know if you're in the zombies, Kurt, are you in the zombies? seen a George Romero film once or twice in my life. <laughs> With us being a hybrid publisher, I started writing this story last year 
a dystopian young adult novel um, where basically, you know, nuclear fallout has occurred and people who have ingested the ashes actually turn into zombies. Some of them, uh, some actually have superpowers and I won't give it away, but that's pretty much the premise. And in this journey of this one female protagonist along the way. And um, I was approached by this guy who had a comic and we were just trying to get started with Star Child Comics. And he was like, hey, I got this comic I'd like to send to you. Maybe you guys can publish it. I read it. I enjoyed it. It was a zombie novel. So I'm like, man, it'd be great to have four first issue superhero and then have a zombie comic as well. So we kind of go into business and then eventually he kind of pitched like a counter offer for me to actually have the rights to it. And I was like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not paying all of that. I'm not investing in all of that for an un known IP. And I was really sad, Kurt. I was like, man, I really wanted a zombie comic, <laughs> you know, but I had just finished writing um, the uh, young adult uh, dystopian novel with the zombie elements. And I remember I just heard God kind of talking to me like, you know, you make up your own comic now, you know, you've got, you've already got something established. Why would you, you know, worry about that? And I was like, you know what, you're right. So at the beginning of this year, I started uh, writing the next book, in that uh, series, it's called the Broken Series. And so the novel represents book one and then book two is honestly the comic. Uh, so I wrote that script, kind of extending that story out following right after the book was done. And man, I'm so proud of it because I'm like, this is exactly what I think people should really get out of a zombie comic that kind of extends my own story. So uh, I think this is something that's organic. I think it's gonna be something that we're gonna continue to do over time. Um, we have some other uh, authors in our state who actually have some science fiction. We actually have some fantasy that they've been like, you know what? I like what you guys are doing. I think I want to actually go ahead and write me a comic script, you know? So we're going to kind of handhold them through the process to make sure that they have all the right beats and acts broken down so that their comic is good. We've recruited, uh, right now we've got over five teams of, uh, four teams of comic artists. We have some colorists in the, who are independently commissioned with us as well. Uh, Broken itself is going to have a guy who's doing the colors just for the comic covers. I'm using Bruno Abadas, who's going to be working on the uh, coloring on the interior, who basically did everything for me on the cape. And I have Rom uh, Silva, uh, Silva, who actually worked on the uh, black and white inks in Broken. So all, all that to say, if people really are into comics and they're really into superheroes and they're really into fantasy and all that cool stuff, you know, we want to be the publisher that people come to because if they go to our page and they look at everything we have going on, there's a lot to uh, engage with and get involved with. And we're going to cover the, we have a wide net. We're going to cover the entire gamut of all of that great uh, pop culture stuff. So I think that um, I'm inviting people to come on board and see what we got because I think they're going to really, really be surprised. It's safe to say that you're going to be busy for many decades to come. I'm not going to use decades because you got so much content and so many talented people in the team that, that are working with you as well too. So come up with, I should say, regarding yeah. <laughs> your entire media production company. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? If it comes down to writing, that's a tough one because there's so many. I think Octavia Butler comes to mind. Um, just her journey uh, from the from the beginning rose to the end of, and all the stuff that she put together. I would actually, man, who else is a writer? I think I would just kind of base it. And the first book that I ever read that was science fiction was uh, Ray Bradbury. From a professional perspective, you are an actor. You are a comic writer. You are a CEO of a media publishing company and you have done many things professionally so you are successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful i think so i mean i think that anybody who and i, and I do this a lot as a motivational speaker if you find a dream you set the steps that uh, and in order or direction of the course that you need to go in order to create um, or build that dream, and then you actually see it manifest itself, I think that makes you a success, whether, whether it's about how much money you've made or not. I think I had this vision of doing this with the company in 2010, when I first started writing uh, Protostar, and I'm writing it in a hotel room one night, and I started just getting discouraged, I started getting um, 
writer's block. And then I remember God started showing me in visions all the things that were happening. He was like, hey, you're going to have characters on lunchboxes, on posters. Kids are going to be loving him. They're going to be. And it just became overwhelming. And this is before I even started about superheroes. I was just thinking about this one book I was writing. And I thought that that was just that piece, that that's what he was talking about. And I actually closed the laptop and was like, this is too big for me. I don't have time for it. I've already got a family, full job. That's not what I was doing this for. And then I got inspired that night. Uh, by a pastor who was on on TV, I was clicking through channels and she started talking about the journey and and being guided uh, by some other voice and really deciding that you have a choice in life. You could either walk the path or you could walk away from it. And uh, I went back to writing. I haven't turned back since. I've written my 17th novel, Broken, will be coming out this year. And um, so I'm really, really uh, enthused and pleased. So I feel that even if I haven't made millions off of this stuff, just to finally see this banner behind me and following the path that was kind of laid out before me, it makes me a person, uh, a person of success. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I, I embrace it. You know, I, I have the, uh, I live by the mantra of, I don't, uh, when I do something, I don't lose. I either win or I learn. So those failures or those bumps in the roads, those pauses in life that have to happen, uh, they've happened since I've been doing this. And I feel like I've learned from them and I feel like I've gone back, I've retooled and I've uh, embraced the changes that need to be made. And I think we've gotten better because of it. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, an artist, or whatever they would like to do creatively. And the fact that you have, uh, you both have the younger generation with you, uh, you are inspiring them in some way, shape, or form. Right. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Uh, they can do what I encourage them to do. And that's basically just, like I said earlier, set a dream, set a plan, decide what goals and objectives have to be met along the way to accomplish the dream and go after it. Like you, they, this generation has everything at their fingertips, literally, you know, they've got their phones, they can go on social media, they can, they can build their own brands. So they have a lot more resources and availability than, than I had or even generation before me. So like they just, all they have to do is just decide they want to do it. And I tell them all the time, you may need to have a job that just helps to fund the uh, steps that have to be taken to, uh, to um, embrace and build your passion. But the day that your passion actually becomes your job, you'll never uh, feel discouraged about going to work and you'll never be discouraged about investing in yourself. So I just tell them to just keep doing that and stay motivated. Well, I do hate to say this, Braxton, and of course, Chantel, who <laughs> had to leave earlier. Right. Uh, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much both for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. <laughs> Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you both on the internet and um, everything like that? Right. First, they can go to the website, Cosby Media Productions with an S. You'll see everything we have going on there. If they want to look at Star Child comics specifically with the artists that we're using and the comics that are being produced, they can hover over the uh, publishing tab and then they'll click on Star Child Comics. That'll take them there. If they want to follow us on social media, We've got Cosby Media Productions um, uh, at, at Cosby Media Productions on uh, Instagram. If they want to follow us on Instagram for Star Child Comics, it's Star Child underscore comics. If they go to Twitter, it's Star Child Comics at Star Child Comics. And if it's Cosby Media Productions on Twitter, it's at Cosby Media Prod. And of course, me, it's Braxton A. Cosby on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. That ends this particular interview on Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a little more updated than our website because I'm only one person, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.